So um, just to give you a little background, I am an emergency medicine physician. I'm a PGY24. Um, I have been uh, vice chairman and the clinical director of the University of Florida in Jacksonville's emergency department for about 12 years. I went from there to VCU, and for eight years I was the director for patient safety systems engineering at VCU. Um, my research background has been in patient safety and human factors. Um, I've spent a lot of time in human factors meetings. I've heard this nice lady in Aisha speak in the past and have come to appreciate the role of human factors in what we do as healthcare providers. Um, and I think that there are some aspects of this, as you can tell from my um, title, that we are spending a lot of time ignoring the complexity that exists within our work. And so my goal is to talk about embracing the complexity and see if we can find a way to reframe our perspective as healthcare providers and as uh, and those from other domains, IT, uh, uh, engineering, um, social sciences, so that we can actually have a better understanding of what this thing is that we're trying to work on. So my objective in 12 to 15 minutes, I want to make that, num that number clear, because usually this is an hour class and an hour long class that I teach, a week long course that we teach at University of Florida on human factors in healthcare. So this is going to be rushed and fast, but I wanted to at least give you a flavor as you see our next three presenters talk about their work and how reframing that can be supported, can, how hopefully this reframe will um, enhance your understanding of the work they've done. I'm also going to highlight some implications of um, a reductionist posture that we tend to take in healthcare with regard to safety and quality and risk mitigation. And we're going to have a little discussion about why I think healthcare is both a noun and a verb. Oh, but it was once so simple. This is a page from Look Magazine, circa 1959, 1960, of the old country doctor. His entire world, everything he could do for his patients was pretty much in that black bag. And he was his own individual system, right? He, if he went from house to house and delivered health care. But since then, things have gotten infinitely more complicated. So that there is not a thing here that could actually fit in his bag <laughs> that he could do by himself, that he could do or use alone. So we've really changed the landscape in 50 years, which means we should also consider how we view health care and how it occurs in the world. So I'm going to start with health care the now. Health care is a socio-technical work system. And I'm going to take a second and let that sink in, because we don't talk about health care as, as having any component of work to it. When I give this lecture to uh, fourth year medical students or third years going into their floor rotations, I ask, how many, I ask them in the audience, usually 100 to 200 students, how many of you have ever had a job in your life? I find that there's usually about six. They've not worked. They don't have a sense of what this thing is that they're entering or that they're about to do, but they know it as more of an, an intellectual uh, exercise as an opportunity to help people, but they don't appreciate how they're going to need to move their hands and feet. So if we think about healthcare as a socio-technical work system, I thought we'd just do a quick review of sort of where that whole concept and theory came from. It is based on work done by Trist et al. in the 1950s, and they were doing study in Britain looking at coal mining. Because the industry was moving rapidly forward, they couldn't quite figure out how the people and the technology was interfacing. And sort of, they realized that something new or different was occurring here in the labor world than they had seen in previous in a state, in a, um, uh, compilations of coal mining in general. So three main features, and I've condensed them significantly, are if you're thinking about something being a socio-technical work system, there are three components. Any enterprise that is a socio-technical work system has multiple components or parts. There's technical components, there's a human component to this, there are tools, tasks, there are work relationships, there are relationships internal and external to the enterprise, and there's an organizational culture that's embedded in it. Number two, interdependencies exist. Okay? They are not an option. It's, our socio-technical work systems are completely dependent upon each other, so any change or ripple on one aspect of the system is going to have a manifestation else, elsewhere. The question is how big will that manifestation be, will we be able to see it, and how far does it propagate? And third, there's external influences that are highly relevant to the enterprise's ability to function. I don't think there's a soul in this room who has not been watching the news regarding ACA that is not thinking about how this gigantic external pressure will affect our socio-technical work system within healthcare. Just take a moment. So if you think of two things in your head, keep them to yourself, that you know are going to be impacted, should that move as an external pressure through and across our work system? 
So when we start talking about socio-technical work systems, healthcare is one. And that's very different than systems thinking, which has become a buzzword and a catchword, catchphrase that we use as sort of the straw man bugaboo of somewhere or something to blame. It's just, we just replace the human being with the system. But it also gives us an out, an opportunity to not have to act on issues related to how the work is getting done because the system did it, but we don't know what we're talking about. Okay? So when we talk about socio-technical work systems, this is a much more nuanced and descriptive and detailed way to think about what you all are asking to do, asking to try to do together, which is team to use technology to move healthcare forward. Other examples real quick that I want to give you of socio-technical work systems in the 21st century are, think about oil and gas, think about the automotive system, automotive cars, not just Tesla and the driverless cars, but think about your dashboard now. I spend all my time pushing some kind of button just to get the car to back up, right? So it's now moved away from just being in your hand or just being in your home to it travels with you in your car, it travels in your pocket. It's also wearable. Definitely in healthcare we see this with pacemakers, varying different monitoring devices, etc. My best example though is Chick-fil-A. Okay. Has anybody noticed a change in the way Chick-fil-A does business? I heard a mm. <laughs> okay. Well, who said that? You tell me what you noticed. All right, don't talk and I'll tell you. So, they pulled, uh, so my little town, there's a Chick-fil-A I have to drive by, I don't eat there, I have to drive by to get to the freeway. And what I noticed in the middle of the summer is that they had done construction. They had changed a single drive through lane to two. They now had workers standing in the drive through with iPads. These young kids are standing there taking your order at the curb. And now you pay at the curb, and when you get to the window, they just check your food out and you keep going. The reason that's an interesting socio-technical system is, think about it, they have taken what was a, a, a normal assumed model for delivering food inside of the building and extended it outward so that now it's interfacing with their customer who's also in a car that's got IT associated with it and they've now made the, the relationship between the employee and the worker, I mean, and the customer, the customer and the worker very different because now they're meeting outside. How different is that in terms of their interaction? And I also noticed that they actually now turn the iPad over and they hang a menu from it in case the patient, in case the patient, huh, in, case the, um, in case the customer has forgotten what they want to order or what they want to do. So that's, I thought that was a brilliant example of a socio-technical work system that was very visible, easy to see, right out there in our midst. If Chick-fil-A can figure it out and they've been incredibly successful, I think we can figure it out too. So this is healthcare as a verb, okay? There's a lot of verbiz verbization, I can barely say that word, or, or verbing, I noticed amongst um, my nieces and nephews. Like they no longer say, I'm gonna look that up. They say, mm, I'm gonna have to do some science on that. Like, science? What does that mean? <laughs> and what they're saying is I'm gonna need to investigate it, assume a hypothesis, make some decisions, see if I can try to understand this issue in, in a succinct way. So I view healthcare in that same way because this is a, the model of healthcare as a work system that I think we should be adopting when we think about socio-technical work. All right? This comes from Pascal Carrion's group. She's an industrial engineer and human factors expert out of the University of Wisconsin. And what she did is she took the industrial engineering model or systems, basic systems engineering model and overlapped healthcare on it. And that was in 2006. How many are in this room are just seeing it for the first time? That says a lot about how we're not overlapping the ways that we should be and we may not be in, in, inculcating these kinds of expertise into our own. So for those who haven't, the gist here is just a work system that um, is comprised of five components we talked about for socio-technical systems, persons, organizations, environment, tasks. All of these are embedded in the work system. They are interdependent, as you can see from the arrows that are based there. There's work that's going on here. It is healthcare work, hence healthcare as a verb. This is dynamic. This is always moving. It's always active. It is not static. Hence, healthcare as a verb makes more sense to me when I start thinking about how do we start teaming? How do we try to understand the environments that we're trying to work together in? And one aspect of that is accepting that this is a constantly moving domain. It does not stop. It's 24-7. And that activity, healthcare as a verb, involves processes and outcomes 
And sometimes we spend a lot of time worrying about the outcome, but not as much about how did this dynamic moving thing actually get there. And we'll talk to me. So let's talk about complexity within that verb. So quick example here, if you study human performance, which is what human factors and ergonomics uh, has a significant um, a hold on their domain. And this is just some very simple numbers about uh, the number of missteps that are possible should you, based on the number of steps in a particular activity. So if you have five steps, there's a 2.5% chance that, you'll be, that there'll be a mishap of some kind. You'll drop something, you'll pick up the wrong thing, something will be done incorrectly. All right? And if there's 50, there's a 22.2% .2 chance that there will be some type of mishap or issue or problem. Now let's take a procedure called a central line placement. My clinicians in the room, how many steps do you think there are in putting one of these in? I heard that command. 20? Does that seem like, at least, does that seem like enough? Because you have to prep the patient, lay them down, you got to arrange your materials. You got, so you, and, and each task or step could actually be you're picking up something. So now we're talking about in the hundreds. This is one procedure that we do multiple times simultaneously across this institution and across the world. So if there's 50 steps and a 22% likelihood of something going wrong or misstep, imagine if there's hundreds. And then let's add, and these are the tools you're trying to use. So now the complexity starts to go up. But for those who are non-clinical, you had no idea that we have to sort through a box of these in order to get what we need together to stick that line in that lady's neck. And then we add the technology, ultrasound guided. So complexity exists. We cannot ignore it. It is there. Technology is not a bad or evil thing, but it does change the way the work actually occurs. This is an example from Eric Holnagel's work uh, related to resilience engineering. He's a very good friend of mine. And he, what I'm describing for you is this idea of work as imagined versus work as it occurs. So one would think it's 20 steps and very easily to put a central line into someone. But when you actually dig deeper into that, it's many more steps than that and much more complex. So this is a, when I was directed to the ER, this was handed to me as a description of how a patient is triaged into an emergency department. Come in the door, do about five steps, and then go on to a room. I then did some work with Chris Nemeth. And that's actually what happens when a patient enters that emergency department. We saw 95,000 patients. This is just triage. Turns out there were six portals of entry into the emergency department. Many of them we had not considered. There were lots of things in terms of which direction and path they took through the emergency department. So here's an example of a reduction model that'll be on your left and work as it actually occurs. Very different than one would have assumed. And I think it's a human trait to be able to do that in order to manage the complexity. I think we're going to have to work very hard on flipping our script so that we assume there's complexity and then are very surprised when something is simple. Okay? So if we take that and overlap it onto the SEEPS model, what we're talking about is not only is the system dynamic, but there's lots of pressures within it and significant ex external pressures as well. Okay? What does that look like in the real world? Right? Any change leads to some kind of a trade-off or goal conflict. Here's a perfect example. Treatment room in an emergency department. Anybody notice anything interesting? Hello? Can't get to the sink. Yes, you can't get to the sink. Okay? What's the trade off? Hand washing. Hand washing. In an emergency department. This is the trade off. Technology is needed. There wasn't discussion about how the work actually occurs. That sink stayed dry. Every time I go by, I just walk by and run my hand on it, dry again. I did that for two years. Okay? And there wasn't even an opportunity to try to move it up and down to get access. It was anchored. So when we talk about technology, sometimes we're just talking about IT, but we can also be talking about other devices and other things that are in the environment. And how does it affect the work? So then when the ED gets dinged for not hand washing enough, whose fault is it? The doctor. I didn't mount this thing. I didn't ask you to put it there. In fact, no one asked me about that. Now that you mention it, and I work in that room. Other issues related to IT? 
This is a workstation in an ED that was, let me go back. So, yeah. This is, a, unfortunately, I didn't give me the whole picture. Um, this is a workstation in ED that had been newly remodeled. Okay. And people were being asked to sit. Interesting. So, yes, there's still paper in the environment. There's always going to be paper. Paper is not evil, it's just paper. But if you look here, there's two phones, two terminals, two people sitting very close to each other. The, the ability to actually function and work in that space is very difficult. And there's another picture that unfortunately I cannot get to that will show you the entire ED. But give me just a second. I want, because I think this is going to be important. Unfortunately, it didn't come up. Oh, okay, it hates me. Let's see if I can bring this to the front, because I think this will, yeah. That's what the ED looks like. What's missing in this picture? Can anybody see the patient? The patients are all sitting behind them, down hallways with pneumatic doors. They can't see them, smell them, because the priority during the construction, we have to accommodate the technology. Again, not bad or evil, but you can start to see the repercussions through the works, the social technical work system, in terms of what the priorities are and what gets traded off. Let's see if it'll go back to where we need to be. Let's try this one. Yeah, I don't want to go that far around. All right, so. Finishing up, talked about that. This is a trauma center, recently built in the last three years. What am I circling and putting squares around? There's a lot of monitors. Not good, not bad, but it was trying to meet a need that the clinicians thought they had. But the question becomes, what is the, need, what is the work really happening? What's the work that's actually occurring in this space? And when you go in for resuscitation, there are tons and tons of people that do show up. But it's interesting if you step to the side and do observations and you'll see that people are looking all around at the varying monitors trying to figure out which one relates to their work. And if that curtain that's on the far right opens up, now you have another monitor for the patient next door. So you can have all these monitors and three active cases going at the same time. We need the technology for monitoring, no question. But how can we use that technology more effectively to meet the work as it's actually occurring? This thing scares the spit out of me. <laughs> I've been asked to do observations with it. I'm just like, no, because I may need one in years to come and I don't want to get PTSD. But it's a long way from this. Okay? <laughs> but we tend to think much more reductionist and simplistic when we think about what's going on in an operating room and the work that actually occurs. So work is imagined versus work as occurs. Finishing up, here's a quick example, unfortunate one, of the impact of the reductionist stance with regard to IT. Very calmed down. There was a laboratory upgrade of some of their uh, analyzers, and specifically one for analyzing DNA probes for sexually transmitted diseases. It was also, at the time, decided to make a change at the same time to how the, the information was reported out because the clinicians had been complaining that they had difficulty with the reading the, the, um, the graphics that were provided. There was, a, uh, oh, for years, there had been a custom program that had been generated or created by the laboratory specifically for the ED quality assistance nurse so that she could review all of the positive blood cultures, all the positive DNA, STDs, anything that came back positive to make sure that the antibiotics prescribed matched the correct bacterium and that the patient had been adequately treated. Fast forward several months, and this young woman notices, you know, I have not seen a positive gonorrhea culture <laughs> in several months. And she's, she literally freaked out. So she's like, this is impossible. We're in over, an urban ED. <laughs> it's everywhere. And it's probably some Indian, I haven't seen any. Oh my God, oh my God. She then finds out that STD, because of the way the code had been written, all the changes that had been made, and I can find details later, that, any, that the STDs that were positive, the DNA probes that were positive, had been missing from that one report, which the lab didn't know about, which IT designers didn't know about, the person who created the patch, were not aware that this actually was a part of someone else's work. The difficult part was hunting down the 275 positive gonorrhea cultures. That was just a several month period. 120 of them had to be hunted down and treated, and 25 of those were children. So think of the socio-technical work system. You start to see how changes in one area 
can lead to, the change can have significant rippling effects elsewhere that you may or may not see. They can be quite latent, quite embedded. So as much work as we can do up front, the better in order to try to ameliorate some of that impact. So in conclusion, I'm offering you um, the, uh, the following thoughts, that a reframing of our perspective of healthcare as a verb and a noun is critical during the development and the in definitely before introduction. But I think development is, a, is probably more important before developing any technology that we're going to put into a socio-technical work system. The SEEPS model is one approach, and we're finding in 2013 with work Rich Holden and Dr. Carrion are doing that it's actually even more complex than what you saw. Okay? There's a lot more embedded in the healthcare work system, especially related to the patient as a form of worker. They are working to get better. They are working to heal. And that we do a lot of adapting and workarounds to make things continue to function within the work system. Finally, a failure to appreciate that will continue to undermine our progress. We've been 21 years in this thing. We're still doing the same things over and over. We're not making as much progress in quality and safety as we would have liked. So partnering with other domains for study, human factors, engineering, psychology, behavioral sciences is important. And as I said before, it gives a more nuanced and, inform and informed approach to any kinds of designs or technology that we want to implement related to quality, safety, and mitigating risk. Thank you.